All right, welcome. We're going to be looking at module four. In this case, module four looks at some of the maintenance management uh, techniques. And in particular, we're going to do an overview in module four and also module five of a range of um, maintenance management techniques. Analytical maintenance management um, has a whole range of specific techniques. They're not necessarily statistical or mathematical, but they can be qualitative or quantitative. And um, they do, in actual fact, uh, put into practice to enable a maintenance unit's productivity and effectiveness to be extended. Um, we can talk about work study, which is either a method study and work measurement. And they go about improving the way a particular task is accomplished. Doesn't matter what it is, um, this particular example, repairing a pipe connection for argument's sake. So it's really down to the nitty gritty. Activity sampling, which from the British uh, Standards Institute um, basically was developed from that, it makes better use of working times. Critical path analysis, it optimizes the integration of the many tasks that comprise a complex project, you know, like a major travel or something like that. So as we go through, we're looking at the work study techniques. These are a systematic examination of the methods performing work with the intention of improving the effective use of resources and set up performance standards. Originally designed to improve worker productivity, but now find application in work estimation, estimate, estimation, quality and safety. So it's a generic term. You can fall into what's called method study, uh, recording, systematic recording, examination of existing and proposed ways of doing work as a means of developing and applying easier and more effective methods, or work measurement as the application of techniques designed to establish the time, standard time, for a qualified worker to carry out a specific uh, job at a defined level of performance. So we'll, we'll explore that as we go through. So work study techniques in general, what relevance do they have to the maintenance organisation? Well, organisational resources uh, available for the method study are always limited. Consequently, the attention is focused on the areas most likely to yield the greatest net cost reductions. High maintenance costs, well, technical aspects, they could be related to poor design for argument's sake, or they could be organisational, in other words, um, poor work methods, um, you know, convoluted work uh, processes within organisations. So method study, or its extension, organisation and methods on M, is applied to maintenance by aiding the designing out of maintenance, that's from a technical point of view, technical aspects, you know, can we redesign the job, redesign the equipment, reduce the maintenance, improve the documentation, so from an organisational point of view, um, procedures, um, whether it be you know, dealing with the actual technical uh, you know, problem itself, or it could be with regards to even you know, communication within uh, an organisation about how to go about ordering parts or spares and that type of thing. Methodising jobs. Well, what that means is that pretty much a job is defined by the method that uh, you use to do it or the tasks that you, know, you have to undertake to get the job done. So basically, um, the job is the method that you do or the method is the job that's getting done. So if you change the method, you change the job. All right, so improving organization and planning overall. Method studies, general procedure is always followed. Techniques for recording and analyzing varies from problem to problem, as you might imagine. Um, the choice of maintenance method study, it should be incorporated in the organization's maintenance control system because obviously it needs to be wired into the organization, uh, whether it's the maintenance level or at um, you know, uh, finance level. Now, you should be able to identify, classify, and arrange an order priority using you know, any analysis. And we'll look at that in module four as well. These high cost maintenance areas which are suitable for solution by this particular method. Technical studies by the maintenance unit with a pilot study adopted to establish the feasibility of docking processes. So really, these are just methods to pinpoint a problem, or pinpoint you know, uh, an opportunity, and basically go about um, identifying it, classifying it, and uh, you know, analyzing it to put things into priority, so therefore then, you know, things and resources, um, you know, things in terms of equipment, um, uh, things in terms of people are being resourced in the proper way. All right, seven distinct steps in the application of the method study. Select the job or problem that you want to focus on, define the objectives of that job or problem, record all the relevant facts, and again, that's something that you might already have some data on, or maybe you have to sit down and uh, brainstorm and critically think about how you would collect, uh, you know, and record particular data to help you define, you know, the actual problem, because sometimes the problems are obvious. Um, you might think uh, we've got a solution to the problem, but, you know, we have to then examine all the activities critically, develop the best method, install the agreed method, 
maintain the mod modified method. Now, what that might mean is that it might have to go around, it's a bit like a uh, design cycle. That's all well and good at concept level. You then try and pilot it, put it into practice, and then you've got to have a feedback loop that comes back and says, oh, that's not really working. We need to modify it before we can actually maintain that as the new modified method. Now, before any evaluation of a situation, the necessary information must be collected for recording in the most convenient form, which should be that which is best suited to circumstances. So in other words, it's no good having reams of information. It's no good having you know, uh, you know, a computer full of information if it is just information. Information turns into data when you go about analyzing it, and then data turns into results and also applications when we go about critically analyzing it and uh, you know, trying to figure out efficiencies and better ways of doing things. Now, you can map out processes, so technical process charts, so that job method, methodization, in other words, whatever method or task that you're doing is really what the job is. So, you know, if we go about here, this is just a particular example, looking at a flow uh, process chart, so that would be um, looking at that. But if you change the process, then, you know, you might need new skills, you might need different skills, you might not use some of those skills. So that's what we go about um, with job methodization studies, go about defining what the actual job is and the things that you'd have to do. Maintenance organizational studies, well, again, you, you know, uh, you might have a, a less detailed flow um, process chart, but this is the way that you would go through and do it. So again, defining it from an organizational um, perspective. Documentation, so again, you know, as you well know, there's always paperwork. So again, who do you send the piece of paper to? Who has to act on it? Um, once it uh, is finalized, uh, who, who then gets notified to pay for those spare parts that you've used, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you're mapping out the process as some sort of flow chart that you can do from an organizational point of view, uh, in terms of communication, finances, that type of thing. Um, getting you know the parts that you require and also from you know the job point of view and the specific tasks that you need to do. Um, and then the whole maintenance process because again this particular task that you're talking about might only be one small part of say you know overhauling a truck for argument's sake or looking at a conveyor belt or something like that. So they're you know only you know two particular parts of the chain in getting the whole process going on. So therefore then, you know, as you map these things out individually, you then have to look at the bigger picture and try and see, well, the truck picks up the coal, the iron ore, takes it over here, so it puts on a conveyor belt, conveyor belt, oh, yeah. so you've got to look at it in connectedness as well. All right, critical examination of the method study. Um, the critical examination of information is the major point, and you've got to look at the job as a whole and successively identify the elements as you go about examining and deconstructing it really. Using the procedure shown on that standard performer below and um, determine whether, you know, maybe you can eliminate things, maybe you can simplify things, or maybe just even modify them to get a better method that's more efficient. Um, you know, efficient in terms of not just time, but it might be in terms of human resources, uh, you know, how many mechanics do you need? Um, how many, you know, mechanical engineers do you need to have to go out and do that? Uh, how many people in your design team? Uh, and also, of course, uh, so if you like people, finance, and um, equipment. So your critical examination, uh, whatever the activity might be, uh, let's say a conveyor belt, overhauling it and trying to see what's going on. Uh, what is it you're trying to do? How are you going to go about doing it? When do you need to do it? How often do you need to do it? Uh, where are you going to do it? Is it the conveyor belt that's on this side or another side? Is it that troublesome one that we always have? Who's going to do it? Who's going to oversee doing it? Then the alternatives, well, hang on a minute, maybe we can do this more efficiently. What else can we think of that may need to be done at the same time? Well, okay, we're going to take the belt off, or the conveyor belt. Oh, maybe we should check the bearings on the rollers while we're there. So, you know what I mean? You can, you can um, deconstruct the task, but realise, of course, that you can couple things together as well. So that, that's the idea. What should we do? What shouldn't you do? Uh, when else should you do it? That type of stuff. So, as you might imagine, that's a pretty standard kind of, like a mind map, it's a thinking process. So um, this is a good way to go about doing it. And as you can see, you record that, and then in time, you might uh, deconstruct that again, analyze it and see, oh, well, that didn't work very well, or it doesn't work very well currently. How can we go about um, improving on that? So work measurement, uh, standard time work measurement, uh, it's defined by the British Standards Institute as, very nice formal definition, the application of techniques designed to establish the time, termed the standard time, for a qualified worker to carry out a specific job at a defined level of performance. In other words, 
uh, it, it's a comparative thing. If we can define it as a standard time, standard job, then obviously we can look at, um, you know, in this particular interest uh, industry, for argument's sake, um, it's being done efficiently. So therefore then, uh, if we go and shift it over to another industry, exactly the same job, the reality is that we have a comparative measure. Now it's used to improve and control the effectiveness of the maintenance work planning, and also as a basis for the employment of incentives to improve workforce performance. Now standard time for a job consists of the time taken to complete a job, the basic time, when working at the accepted standard rate, plus time allowances for the ergonomic and environmental conditions under which the job is being carried out. Uh, environmental conditions, as you might imagine, if you're out on the field and you're trying to change a tire, well, you know, those conditions, ergonomic and environmental, are far different to having that vehicle, truck, haul truck, uh, a grader, whatever it might be, bulldozer, in, in, the, in the shop, you know? So therefore then, you might find, of course, that uh, the standard rate and standard time um, are going to be different for those two, two um, arenas, even though it's the same task of changing a tire or whatever the case might be. Um, the standard rate uh, work measurement, different people work at different rates and the times for identical jobs vary considerably. So the standard rate defined by the BSI, uh, you know, needs that careful definition. They define it as corresponding to the average rate at which qualified workers will naturally work at a job provided they are motivated to apply themselves. So in other words, you know, get in, get the job done if you're a qualified person and typically, um, you know, uh, some people get in and do it well, do it quickly but do it well, some people do it slowly but do it well. So therefore, you know, this average measure is a way of at least uh, having some comparative measure. This leads to the idea of a standard performance which the, uh, the British Standards Institute defines as occurring, if the standard rating is maintained and the appropriate relaxation taken, in other words, you know, you don't work 400 hours and then suddenly you stop, um, or you, you, know, you work all morning from four o'clock in the morning through to you know, nine o'clock in the morning and then you know, have a rest, and therefore then either change shift or literally have smoko. So the idea, of course, is that keeping in mind that there are rest breaks, there are times when you need to physically go over and get another, you might go to the stores and get some equipment. So if the standard rating is maintained and the appropriate relaxation taken, a worker will achieve standard performance over their working day. It's the ability um, to measure a worker's performance that provides the basis for many incentive schemes. So in other words, if you're working efficiently, then you might get a bonus or some sort of incentive. So what we're gonna do is start um, looking at uh, things like uh, teasing out a little bit more about um, the standard ratings and standard times. All right, so work measurement procedures. Work measurement procedures use data obtained from the past or present observations to make reliable predictions about standard times for future jobs. Generally, such standard times are based on data obtained by obviously direct observation, uh, a time study, you know, the old time, uh, time in motion studies. Uh, thing of the 1930s, but they're still used today in terms of, um, you know, literally somebody perhaps with a stopwatch, perhaps not, uh, watching and documenting what people are doing and how long that would take. So that's called a time study. Uh, synthetic methods uh, basically go about uh, doing things in different ways. Uh, estimation from records or experience. So in other words, if you have, you know, a person that's been you know, in the workshop for a long time, then obviously they're well aware of what you know, has to be done, how long it should take, etc., etc. So all those things feed into defining the standard time and standard rate. So this time study, the standard time is obtained by timing and rating the job that's been carried out. Divide the job into easily distinguishable job elements. Obviously you've taken the tire off, then you know you um, take out the nut, where you jack it up, you, well, before you even do that, you make sure it's safe, so the handbrake's on for argument's sake, you chop everything out, you, you've got it all level, um, you jack it up, you're using the right jack, uh, then obviously uh, uh, start loosening up the nuts, et cetera, et cetera. So each element of that is, is the vehicle level, um, is the jack in the right position, is the jack at the right height, all that kind of stuff. It's all the elements that make up, the job elements that make up the overall job. So establishing the basic uh, time for a job element to be completed by modifying the observed time to allow for the rate at which the element was judged to be performed. So over that standard time, so this is what we're doing. We're just basically deconstructing the job. The standard time is the complete job, for the complete job, is then deduced by summing up all those little standard times of each of the constitu you know, cons uh, constituted uh, elements of the job. So as I said about, is the vehicle on the level ground? Is the jack in the right position? Is the, you know, jacked it up to the right height? 
have you undone the nuts, et cetera, et cetera. So each one of those things, we sum up all those little things to figure out how we're all what happens. Work major procedures, um, particular synthesis, so you're compiling standard data about the job. So many job elements are common to a range of activities and their basic elemental times can be compiled into a library of standard data. From changing oil uh, in you know, a haul truck in Australia compared to changing it in downtown uh, you know, China or something. Well, the reality is, is that they should take reasonably the same amount of time. Um, changing an oil filter, an air filter, whatever the case may be. So that library of standard data from which standard complete job times can be synthesized without recourse to actual timing all the time. So in other words, you don't have to you know, do this experiment every time in every organization and every place on the earth. You should have, you know, pretty much you know, look up the standard table uh, of complete job times and be able to use that as a basis for discussion. Standard data can be compiled directly from time study or less directly from predetermined motion time systems. Work measurement procedures, predetermined motion time studies. We talk about a methods time measurement, number one, MTM one. Standardized, time, standardized times for basic human movements in time units of 0 0.00001 hours at a British standard rating of 83.3. So you end up with these tables of these type of things. And this particular one here, um, what happens is, is that Looking at the, you know, the movements that a particular worker goes through. So they reach for things, they move, they turn, they apply pressure, they grasp things, they position it, blah, 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 blah. So what happens is that you have a whole range of these tables that go about looking at those aspects. And then, of course, you can have these um, as lookup tables to, if you're trying to design, redesign a particular job, um, trying to define, um, you know, standard time or standard rate, then you go and look up this type of table. This table here is the table for reach when you're reaching to, to um, for an object. So for highly repetitive short cycle production work, tables can be used to establish that standard time directly. Okay, so you can also be used to build standard data elements for maintenance work. So if you build it up for reaching over to do X, Y, and Z, for moving about, picking up stuff, jacking up stuff then you're able to document it over a particular time. So this type of thing here, as you see in this um, particular uh, you know, range of documents. And then once you've done that, you're able to then synthesize those into you know, a full time, standardized time, standard rate for a particular job. Um, the met the predetermined motion time studies um, two or, or methods time measurement two is a simplified uh, measurement time um, in motion study. Um, it only has 39 times um, values, so 120 times values in the reach table above. So, you know, as you might imagine, it's much more reduced in the way that um, you're looking at uh, defining those kind of characteristics. So the simplified system used to build the maintenance and specific um, methods time measurement is, comes about, you know, data blocks and synthesis. You're basically producing these things. All the techniques outlined so far are originally designed for analysing short cycle repetitive production work. So, you know, when Henry Ford and, you know, the production line and time in motion in the 1930s when they were doing this, first of all, it was for that kind of short cycle. Here, I'm going to screw up this tyre, then it moves along the assembly line, somebody goes and puts on the fender, moves on the uh, assembly line, somebody puts the radiator in. So it's short cycle, repetitive and it's production on a production line, that type of thing. So a lot of this thing grew out of those kind of time and motion studies. However, for maintenance, the inherent variability, diversity, and singularity of the tasks inhibit the application of these type of techniques. Consequently, some form of estimation is necessary. So again, you know, you could say maintenance is like a production line, but the reality is, is that, you know, it is um, broken up into tasks, changing a diet, changing the oil filter, changing the oil, whatever the case may be. But also there are variabilities, diversities, and singularities about the maintenance task, different to this previous um, production line where short cycle repetitive production work was occurring. So you have to adapt and modify your processes and come up with new things. And that's the whole point about looking at these maintenance measurement techniques. So maintenance work measurement, uh, they're based on the analytical techniques described, but also involve some degree of estimation. estimation. Uh, and it's evolved over time. So as you can see, it's made of these different elements. Um, we're going to talk about some of these, comparative estimating and a few other things in a moment. So interesting diagram, but the reality is it's just saying that over time, we've had to extend and look at it a different way, how you go about doing maintenance compared to say doing production things. 
um, comparative estimating. Uh, it's the most sophisticated form of these techniques and it's based on the universal maintenance standards. 1950s developed by the Methods Engineering Council in Pittsburgh uh, in the US, uses the yardstick for introduction of incentives and maintenance. It's 1964, first UK application, and now basically it's used in many forms, particularly in the UK, but across um, other countries as well. Now the standard time for a job is um, estimated by comparison with a range of classified jobs called benchmarks, as you might imagine, whose basic times have been derived from the UMS or alternative um, procedures. And again, this is this kind of lookup thing. And rather than having your industry having to do all the measurements again, you can go and look up benchmarks or, or you know estimation estimation by comparison. Benchmarks are classified by the trade, task area, and the time range, and arranged on spreadsheets. So you can look them up. Many spreadsheets are necessary for a given maintenance workforce, and the job being estimated or slotted uh, allocate the average basic time for that range of jobs, which has a work content which is specific. The times for job, travel, and personal needs are then added. So in other words, a bit like the resting time, a uh, bit like you know what time travel time you have to go over to say the parts to go and get some spares or the case may be. Now the outcome over a period of time, the positive and negative job time errors inevitably occurring, you know, they cancel each other out, and then you get this averaging effect on getting your level acceptance for the use of that maintenance group incentive schemes. So, you know, it, it, it came out of that regards, you know, if I can convince my workers to do, um, take up some of these practice and be more efficient, then there's some incentive that I could give them payment, um, you know, more holidays, that type of thing. So comparative estimating, the objective is to raise the productivity by improved planning and workforce performance. And as I say, uh, it grew out of um, giving incentive schemes to groups and um, you know, as a rule of thumb, in some places, 30% bonus for improvements in standard practice regimens. Again, you know, uh, this is not standard, it happens at different 30% uh, bonus and maybe a whole range of things. As I say, over the years, that uh, focus has changed from, you know, being, say, purely financial to um, uh, given time off to a whole range of, you know, uh, negotiated um, uh, claims. So category estimating is similar to comparative estimating. It's based on the observation that in similar workshops, work groups, the average time for that particular job, you know, from all those samples, uh, should be pretty much the same or, you know, at least, at least constant. Statistical analysis occurs, and you can go about looking at, um, in this case, uh, logarithmic normal product uh, probability distribution. So interesting equation, but the reality is, is that you're able to use a statistical analysis. Now we're using these uh, quantitative processes rather than qualitative, uh, where you, you know, somebody was experienced saying, oh, well, you know, it should be about this time. So now by modeling it mathematically, and this is, we're gonna look more at modeling um, a little bit later, you're able to then start predicting using these models, mathematical models, to help you get better ideas of improving efficiencies. Um, of how to do the maintenance or when you should do the maintenance or and how often you should do the maintenance. So this is pretty much it. Uh, this table is just um, going through and showing uh, the time spread with the average job time calculated for each category. Times can be standardized by uh, you know, job standard for each category. So same thing again, so look up table. Uh, again, uh, category estimating, the supervisor of each working group is trained to categorize each job. So therefore, then they're able to deconstruct it uh, and able to look up the table or you know some sort of uh, comparative estimate to enable them to have a better idea of whether their workforce is working to the standard times and standard rates. The estimation is based on that experience and therefore compared to comparative estimating, uh, which is based partly on experience and partly on direct comparison with similar jobs. With category estimating, the accuracy of the estimation procedure um, is checked periodically. That way you can keep analyzing your job to see if they conform to this logarithmic normal probability distribution. And that's what we're saying. We're trying to map you know, processes and behaviors to a mathematical process. Um, so as you can imagine, sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing because you're trying to drive humans to you know, follow the mathematics, if you know what I mean, to, to get the get the answer. But the reality, of course, is that you have to design the job, the behaviours involved in that job, such that it gives those efficiencies that come out from the mathematical modelling of the processes, which, you know, in hand come from modelling what the, what the human does. So it's a mix between the two. 
So, and as we said, category uh, estimating is using incentive uh, schemes all around the world uh, now. The advantage over comparative estimating is it does not require uh, applicators and since standard data is not required, less expensive to install. So in other words, you don't have to get people to come in, uh, these applicators, and uh, do time and motion studies. As I say, you've got a whole range of um, standard data that you're able to go and look up um, and use, like from the British Standards uh, Institute, that type of stuff. Um, maintenance work management, data block synthesis. Uh, it's developed by, um, as we talk about those um, uh, time management, uh, maintenance time management association in the UK. It relies on classification of the maintenance work into relatively few characteristic motions. In other words, the time for each of which must be determined using the, um, the MTM2 that we talked about beforehand for groups of workers and suggested uh, mechanical repair work can be classified into 13 blocks of data. So basically, as we cycle through again, we're looking at, um, uh, again, it's about deconstructing these jobs and, and uh, you know, unfastening, fastening, um, removing, capturing the handle, etc., etc. So, it, as I say, these time and motion things from the 1930s were just very, very um, interesting in, in literally um, timing people and watching them and then um, making people part of the production lines. This is what Henry Ford and a lot of other people did. And um, the idea was that, you know, people did literally become part of the machine. They were cogged in the machine. Um, and again, you know, that led to a lot of um, labour changes uh, in the 1940s and the 50s, etc. So um, the principles, though, even though it might sound, uh, you know, quite mundane and quite uh, industrialised, the reality is, is that they are important things and they are ways to do efficiencies and, you know, uh, do things better in terms of, you know, how people go about doing things. Don't forget you can design into a job now instead of being just a cog. Um, the idea, of course, is that, well, people need to have a break, don't they? Because they can't continuously work at that rate. So there are good things that come out of it. And, of course, you know, uh, noise levels, sound levels, et cetera, et cetera. So safety and uh, whole risk assessment type of stuff came out of these uh, movements as well. Um, analytical estimating. Um, it's a structured estimation technique. Work is analysed into basic steps and standard times are applied to those particular steps. It's similar to those, you know, other estimations that we've talked about, uh, but it's more laborious because the time content of each job has to be synthesised from stored standard data and a low ratio of workforce to anal analysis is required. So for repetitive maintenance work, the more long-standing methods of time study are quite appropriate. So again, these are just some different estimation processes that, you know, really you won't come across in lots of ways. They're in the background because all these type of things have already been designed or, you know, if your organisation is going about looking at these kind of restructuring, then obviously um, these comparative estimations, these tables that we're talking about, about standard times and standard rates, would be something that would go into the, the work plan. Um, so what are the cons and costs and consequences of um, maintenance work measurements? Well, it cannot be introduced effectively unless there's a great deal of attention already given to the general organisation. Now, that's the general organisation of the maintenance unit itself or the maintenance department, but also how the maintenance department works with um, the rest of the organisation. So, the communication, again, within the maintenance unit and uh, with other parts of the organisation and supplies external as well. The documentation that's involved, again, you can spend all your time doing that paperwork just to get, you know, a spark plug. So uh, stores organisation, again, it's no good having lots of stores that are just sitting on the shelf for a long time. Or uh, if you have to, you know, it's no good being in, uh, in a mine, uh, on mine site and you've got to wait for something to be delivered overnight. The job equipment, again, you know, is it new, old? Transportation about how you move, again, resources like humans over to go and fix something else on site for argument's sake. Or how do you move, you know, the vehicle, the uh, piece of uh, equipment to a workshop. So unless those things and you know have been worked on and there's a, a pretty good idea of how those things work, then you know work measurements are going to be quite frustrating because you're going to get all these you know cross purposes because you, if you can't get your good communication, you know you can't get your stores uh, or your equipment, well then it's all going to fall apart. You're not going to take accurate measurements or be able to go about and defining efficiencies uh, if they are not, you don't have a good snapshot of what's going on in the overall organization. 
Um, the costs and consequences are greatly increased the maintenance unit's um, productivity. So if given attention to those particular areas of communication, documentation, etc., then uh, when the maintenance is being set up, now as we well know, that's on a, on a green side, but if you're on a brown side, well then a lot of these things are obviously in place. So, it, you know, it can work really well in, in um, improving the maintenance unit's productivity if you're designing it from scratch, but again, um, it doesn't automatically follow that um, if you introduce these things that it will work, whether it's on a green side or a brown side. So again, it's about uh, analyzing making sure that um, you're checking and putting in the appropriate procedures and processes. Uh, costs and consequences, inducing, introducing work measurements, uh, you can assess the possible benefits, so you can improve trade force um, performance through associated incentive schemes, improve work planning and methods, improve control. I guess even, as I say, improve safety and uh, you know, better uh, risk management as well. Against the associated costs is of, uh, you can get consultants in to help you figure out this kind of stuff. Uh, work measurement data, you know, where do you get that from? Um, training of applicators, in other words, people that come in and do these things or people that are on your site already and they go through and they've been now qualified to take measurements and time people and, and define the jobs and that type of thing. And that means training for argument's sake. It may get, mean downtime, they might have to be taken away to get that training. So, you know, obviously that's a cost. Uh, incentive scheme bonuses and then extra planning for stuff and other long and short-term consequences might be a whole range of things as I say downtime um, you've taken that particular supervisor you've taken those particular people away then obviously who's going to do their job while they're not there all right still looking at the cons costs and consequences of the procedures outlined comparative estimating uses a standard data to provide those benchmarks Technique is best suited to the large maintenance trade force. Installation operation costs are likely to be too great for smaller maintenance uh, trade force units. But in those cases, managerial problems are less because you've got less people, uh, you've got less managers, and uh, they are well organized first line supervisors. There's probably less benefit to be gained from that work measurement based incentive schemes. If nevertheless such a scheme is being introduced, say, you know, the workforce might be saying, ah, oh, you know, I'm overworked because this is really inefficient, inefficient what we're doing. So therefore, you know, if the workforce starts saying, hang on a minute, we really do need to do something about this. Category estimating with its low installation and operation costs is probably more appropriate. The, uh, all the work measurement based incentive schemes effective in motivating transports for one or two years, that's been reflected that, you know, uh, category estimating has, uh, has worked quite well. Now work measurement, only one of several techniques used singly or in conjunction for increasing productivity needs to be introduced um, because increased productivity means for the smaller trade force requirement for the same maintenance load or uh, you've got an increased load for the small workforce so it's juggling those two things the success of change development upon the political climate of the plant externally internally so again uh, whether it's on site for argument's sake it could be the political environment it could be the work uh, environment in terms of the team effort, if you like, or, or setting that up, compared to either uh, also if I look externally, then if you're on site compared to the parent company might be, you know, in another state or another country, then as you might imagine, the politics and the processes that are involved there, uh, you know, are going to impinge greatly on, you know, the success of this type of um, introduction for work measurements. Now, it cannot be operated successfully without full cooperation of the people involved in trade unions, because obviously you're talking about, you know, retraining people, you're talking about deconstructing their job, you're talking about, when you start doing those kind of things, people get a bit nervous because you're trying to define what they do and that type of thing. So, you know, it, it's all done hand in hand with those uh, cooperatively. Now, it can um, aid good maintenance management, but it's, it's, it's not the panacea, it's not, it's not the medicine, it's not, it's not the cure for all maintenance ills, because as we well know, um, maintenance scheduling, maintenance planning, uh, you know, new equipment, old equipment being maintained, you know, there are a whole range of different things besides figuring out and deconstructing whether I'm doing the job within a particular standard time or at a standard rate. So, yes, it, it's, it's a useful technique, but it's not a solution for everything. Activity sampling, uh, way back again, see a lot of this stuff came out of the 1930s, but in 1935, activity sampling was developed by some guy called Tippett. He was at the British Cotton Industry Research Board in Manchester. It was used to obtain information about activities or delays, and it's based on some, the same uh, statistical principle as quality control. So you have snapshot observations of humans 
and what they're doing and also of machines and what they're doing. And um, again, uh, so that you don't compromise processes and people know they're being, you know, a bit watched today, uh, it's done randomly. So you turn up to them and say, oh, okay, well, we're going to watch what's going on. So as you might imagine, just doing one or two observations are very good. So as always, the more observations that are made, then, you know, the better idea you get on the variances that are occurring. So if, say, 100 observations made of a fitter during a representative study period and found to be uh, inactive on, say, 15 occasions, uh, then what it means is that generally that the inactivity is 15 out of 100 or 15 percent. Obviously, precision of estimation increases the number of observations. So the more times you do this, you might find it's 13, not 15, that type of stuff. Um, clearly, continuous observation would give precise measurements of the time spent on different activities, but could be inconvenient, if not expensive, and probably misleading due to the biasing. So in other words, somebody's looking over your shoulder all the time, you've got a camera on you, or somebody's literally standing there with a stopwatch, you just go, well, obviously, you're not going to feel like, you know, you're going to feel under pressure or you're going to get really annoyed, so therefore then, you know, you're going to go faster or less. So what, so it's just, it's got to be done, you know, in, in a conducive uh, manner to, you know, correctly observe, measure and analyse and then critically uh, analyse what's going on. Conversely, any information derived from only a very few observations would be very imprecise, obviously. So the question is, how many random snapshot observations are needed to achieve a given degree of precision? Precision of estimate of any activity will increase the greater the total of novel observations, just common sense, and the greater the proportion of time actually taken up, you know, with the activity, because a sufficiently large score would move rapidly accumulate. In other words, you know, if I'm doing this particular task, then, you know, the greater proportion of time actually taken up in the activity compared to, okay, I'm going to start timing it now, start looking at it, you've got to set up, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's that streamlined kind of process, whereas if somebody's just observing what you're doing without interacting or, you know, basically stopping you from doing what you're doing or to start measuring, um, then obviously they're going to have better observations, aren't they? They're going to have more truthful observations of what's actually going on. So again, with activity sampling, um, we can do little measurements. Uh, we can talk about the desired percentage precision, probable uh, percentage of time spent on that particular activity, required total number of observations, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is where mathematical processes come in to start defining and helping to um, you know, set standard times and standard rates. So th this little example here, we're talking about desired percentage precision of say 10%. Uh, the probable percentage of time spent on a particular activity, 25%, and then what's the required number of observations. So for that particular situation, we're saying that we have to at least make 75 observations. 75 times um, that has to be done. Okay, so as you can see, it is very time consuming, very resource um, hungry. So the reality, of course, is that um, maybe this is not the technique that a person in your organisation would use. You'd have to find some other technique. So activity sampling, the period of study must be truly representative of the investigated human or machine activity. In other words, it's no good if, you know, you turn on the machine and basically, um, yeah, you watch it for 10 minutes when really the task takes, you know, 25 minutes. Um, so, you know, you need to use your technical engineering knowledge, uh, practicality and that type of thing. So you're getting a, a representative measurement or study of what you're looking at and what the person's doing or what the machine's doing. Snapshots must be taken at purely random times. In other words, um, that's all whole idea of statistics uh, and uh, doing analysis and doing measurement. Uh, you, otherwise, you're preempting. You're, you're setting up a false um, situation. So it has to be done randomly. Um, so that. Generate a list derived from the activities and delays in the maintenance trade force. Um, we talked about that before. Snap observation tools around activities of selected number of maintenance fitters carried out at random intervals over a representative period. So again, as you shift through, say, the, um, uh, you know, the mine site for argument's sake, then you're randomly saying, okay, we're going to go and look at that today. Um, you go and look at that particular uh, process or technique that that particular group might be doing fitters or whatever it might be, and then another day you might shift on to something else. The, um, illustrate that the uh, arithmetic, the total number of person snapshots, you know, say 870 of these things, and on 205 of these activities observed that were working with the tools or equipment, then the percentage of time spent on the activity is obviously 205 out of 870, so 23.6% is, you know, the amount of time they've been working with the tools or the equipment. And of course, as you build up the table, you can have all these different things. So as I say, 
uh, clerical work on job cards, searching for equipment. So you can go about basically doing these kind of measurements to see how efficient, to see how you improve efficiencies, to see how you can improve uh, the overall job in actual fact. Uh, information thus obtained for management control, total utilization of the group. In other words, it's, it's all shared and the whole idea of that is that if you're making improvements in this area, well, maybe there's other improvements to be made in other areas. So therefore then um, overall, the maintenance group or the workforce themselves are part of it. Percentage of time spent on different tasks and hence areas where improvement was needed, areas of excessive relaxation, waiting and walking time. So again, it's, again, we don't want people running around like machines either. So it's the balance between those things and also realizing that you've got a human interacting with machinery or with a production line, uh, whether it's a physical production line, like a car production line or a production line in terms of picking up, you know, iron ore extracted from here, move to there, move to there. So it's all part of a production line, but the reality is, is that, you know, physically it takes you 15 minutes to drive from there to there. Well, again, that's 15 minutes you have to add into the actual task. You can't just zero that. Um, so the individual work observations are also instantaneously rated. Uh, and that's an extension called the, the rated activity sampling. It's also possible to obtain an overall effectiveness index, uh, as you can see from the bottom here. Again, this is just doing some uh, percentages really. But the real idea to take away is that with the activity sampling, you're literally sampling the activity at random times to see what is occurring, um, breaking it down into different parts, and then seeing which parts are less efficient than others. So uh, in some ways, it can be, you know, you might feel as if, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I, I am a cog in a machine. But otherwise, too, it can turn around and highlight that you are a cog in a machine. And the reality is, is that as a human being, you can't do that. The point of that is you have to have more relaxation time. The reality is, is that, you know, you have to be given longer periods to, to complete parts, you know, little job elements, as well as the overall job. So, yeah, it's not all bad or it's not all mechanical in the context that uh, you might think. Queuing theory. Well, the mathematical analysis of waiting is really what it's all about. So another technique is uh, queuing. Okay, so it's used to analyze the waiting time of people or jobs, waiting for attention in service facilities and shops, banks, anything, anything that's got a line basically. So uh, hospitals, um, production facilities. It's used to determine the crew size and waiting or delay times and maintenance context. So in other words, for maintenance, you know, if, if you've got three trucks coming in today, well, it's a queue, isn't it? So the reality is, is that you might only be able to work on one of them at a time, or you might be able to work at two of them at a time. So again, how much um, time does it take and how much uh, you know, trades bill do you have to put on that? And of course, um, as a queue, uh, do you need uh, you know, a truck to come in uh, uh, this morning and then another truck's gonna come in this afternoon? It's a queue. So useful studying dynamics of repair situation and can be used to provide an approximate solution to more straightforward maintenance organization problems. As you see, the arrivals of those trucks queued up, you um, put them into your service facility and fix them and then out they go to the other side. So, you know, this is very important to um, maintenance organisation. And again, you know, are you able to multiply, as I say, if you had three trucks, but are you able to shift two at a time or maybe all three can be worked on a time? But again, the implication of course is that you need more tradespeople, you need to make sure all your parts are there. Again, you don't necessarily know the spare parts you need for each individual truck, because that's what's going to show up. Is there an oil filter for this one? Is an oil filter all three of them? An air filter for that one? All that kind of stuff. So, you know, new tyres, whatever it might be. So queuing theory, as I say, literally talks about things lining up, waiting, uh, how long do they have to wait? Um, so the queue forms when the arrival rate exceeds the repair rate. If this is the average condition, then the queue is said to be unstable. Queue forms, even if the reverse situation occurs, in other words, the repair rate exceeds the arrival rate because now what happens is people standing around waiting for the next truck to come up. Queues form if the incidence of arrivals and the variation in service times are probabilistic and for short periods. The arrival rate exceeds the repair rate, so you get a queue length that's continually changing but always finer. Uh, the queue is said to be stable. So you're either getting, you know, uh, things coming in, moving through, and everything nice and timely fashion, or 
uh, you can get really good efficiencies. And what can happen, of course, is that you can get the vehicles through and then the next one's not due for another two days, for argument's sake. But the reality is you're ahead of schedule. So therefore then um, the queue is standing still. So, it, you know, it, it's, you know, there's good things and bad things about moving quickly through a queue or slowly moving through a queue. Now, prior to mathematical analysis of a queuing system, following minimum information must be obtained. So, problem distribution expressed as an analytical function or probability density function. In other words, it could be a normal distribution. It could be what's called Poisson. Um, it's a very typical one when we're talking about queuing. Um, so, yeah, or you can have negative um, exponential uh, functions as well. So, in other words, which particular mathematical model, Poisson, the normal distribution, um, the you know exponential function fits whatever Q you have at your particular workplace. Uh, also, the other minimum information as you're doing your mathematical analysis is that um, the probability distribution of the repair times expressed as the probability density function. Again, is it a normal curve? Is it a exponential curve? Is it a Poisson distribution? The queuing discipline, that is the rules governing the queues. So in other words, you have to figure out, well, okay, um, there are going to be some conditions which um, are going to define when um, the queue you know, gets too long, gets too short, um, that type of thing. So yeah. the particular process, so what are you doing? The repair gang structure. So in other words, you know, again, as I said beforehand, if you've got three trucks coming in and you can put all three in the shop, well, that means you need more tradespeople than if you put one truck at a time or two trucks at a time. So yes. So all that basic information needs to be known before you really go about uh, having a better idea of um, the mathematical analysis to help you go about analysing uh, your maintenance issues with regards to queuing. So queuing theory, simple and multi-channel queuing methods. So if we look at uh, figure 411, here we have uh, the arrival and service instance at Poisson. Um, and again, um, we are able to go about um, this little equation here. So you have uh, the arrival rate, some value per unit time. And then your average um, for your service jobs is this other one per unit time, so alpha and uh, lambda, it's lambda. So your utilization rate is the division of the, um, the mean arrival divided by the mean service time. Then the probability is defined as this, um, and therefore then you can use these calculations to give you the average number of jobs in the queue and also the waiting time for a job in the queue. So as a maintenance planner or a maintenance scheduler, you can use these kind of calculations to enable you to figure out, as you can see, how many jobs you can do in the queue and what's the average waiting time. So if you plot that information out, you can get these type of curves. This is a utilization factor. So um, as you can see here, the, uh, this is uh, the utilization rate. So if we go back over the utilization rate was lambda over A. So it's the mean arrival of jobs over the surface rate. So pretty much, as you can see, um, the more people you get in the curve, the longer it's going to take you to work in this particular case. So your queue length is going to get longer. All right, so what it also means is that you can use these type of graphs to turn around and sort of say, well, hang on a minute. If I've got, you know, this particular time period that it's taking me, you can get a better idea of, you know, how many vehicles, I like can say, would be waiting in the queue as well. So it can be used both ways, but it's, valuable information to help you with your scheduling and your planning of your maintenance. All right, let's have a look at an example. A factory has many identical uh, pneumatic machines. A study is made of the time between the arrival of the machine um, breakdown and of the time required for its repair. Now, both distributions are adequately described by the negative exponential probability density function. So not a Poisson, not a normal distribution, but a negative exponential probability density function. The average time between arrivals is found to be 60 minutes and the average time for repair is about 50 minutes. So the repairs are carried out by one gang, three people in it, calculate the mean number of machines in the queue, the mean number of mach machined um, time, you know, the time that the machine spends in the queue and the utilization of the particular gang of three um, people. So again, we can plug in these little um, expressions. So we get um, our mean uh, arrival rate of jobs, so we said that was lambda per unit time, so we're getting one per 60 minutes, which is what we were told up here, so that's one hour, one per hour, which makes sense. Then the mean service uh, rate of the jobs is um, alpha per unit time, so that's one per 50 minutes, that's what we were told. So remember, we're working on an hourly basis, so therefore then that's 60 minutes 
uh, divided by 50. So we're getting, um, you know, through uh, 1.2 serviced vehicles per hour. So therefore then the utilization factor is about 0 0.83. So when we go about doing those calculations, as I said beforehand, you can figure out um, maybe, you know, somebody wants to go on holiday or maybe there's a change in shift or maybe just the scheduling of, you know, tradespeople. It gives you an idea that, you know, if you're gonna get 1.2 machines through in an hour, then you'll say to yourself, oh, hang on a minute, I need two, two tradies um, to do, you know, that part of the processing. So again, the numbers themselves may not mean much, but as I say, you know, in terms of a uh, time unit or, or you know, like the number of vehicles, 1.2 per hour, it does give you an idea to sort of say, well, okay, we're going to do, you know, uh, standard maintenance, which relates to oil changes, filter changes, uh, let's just say those things for a moment. Therefore, then you can say, well, okay, then if I've got a crew of um, three people, then, you know, that's great, because it's going to take, uh, I can do about 1.2 vehicles every hour. If I only had, you know, obviously a gang of two people, well, then that's going to obviously decrease. You're not going to get 1.2 through. Um, you might find that that's going to change your time. Now, it's going to change your time significantly. Well, that's the other key factor. Um, and this is what the efficiencies are that you might find that, you know, uh, if you're working to these kind of standard times and standard rates, then really that one gang of three people is the most efficient way to go about doing it, even though, People are looking at you and going, hang on, your maintenance bill, you've got three tradies there, you know, they're, you know, that's costing us a lot of money. Whereas you turn around and say, well, okay, I've had two tradies here, the reality is it's going to take longer to get those machines back out on site to do things. So they're the kind of discussions that have been used from those numbers. All right, and then again, you can draw a whole range of different graphs. Again, the same idea, plotting out uh, those kind of mean times to the utilization factor, and, and instead of calculating it every time, you can just look up the values. All right, so the reality here is, is that that starts the process of looking at some of these maintenance management type of techniques. Some, again, as I say, quite old, 1930s, these time and motion things came about and then they've been taken from that to just simply stopwatch measurement, deconstructing what jobs are through to mathematical modeling. And we'll look more at mathematical modeling in module five, where uh, now we use mathematical models um, just a little bit about that with Python and uh, you know, the um, exponential, negative exponential um, probability density functions. But by looking at those, that type of mathematics now, we can use those to help us predict things. 